Who is a team that didn't make the playoffs and that is also likely to dominate the 2020s? A team built for success over the next 10 years, but not a playoff team, team like the Dodgers and Yankees. That would be the obvious choice. We'll fight for the Chicago White Sox, a team that has loaded with prospects, both with hitting and with loaded pitching. Loaded with prospects. Loaded with prospects. Luis Robert is supposed to come up this year. You already saw last year what Eloy Jimenez could do. Tim Anderson was a batting champion last year and a phenomenal defensive player. And then when you look at the pitchers, you got guys like Dylan Sees, Michael Kopech, Luke Gio Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Now adding Gio Gonzalez and, and Dallas Keuchel, both as depth pieces. You got Lucas Giolito, who had a phenomenal year last year. So they have young talent and veteran talent all mixed in. They have a ton of money to spend. Uh, when you look at it long term, they're a big market team. And again, when the White Sox have been good, they have spent money. So their owner's not afraid to spend money. They're just looking for the right times to. So I think when you look at it like that, and also the American League kind of being more top heavy when you look at it. Now, it might not be that way down the road, but when you look at the American League being top heavy with the Yankees mainly dominating one end, and again, the rest of it kind of being unknown. You got the Rays who are decent in the athletics, but again, they're teams that always crumble in the playoffs. So the White Sox might be that next team in a weak division with the Tigers and Royals rebuilding to be able to do that and take that next step and dominate. They could dominate in a weak division if the Twins regress and the Indians get older or something like that later down the road. So I, I'll, we'll say the White Sox. I, I would say the White Sox, too, with the young talent that they have coming up, like Speedy was mentioning, and really the veterans that they have. Yasmani uh, Grandel is one of the best underrated catchers in the league, and and he got a lot of money this off se- last off season. Mm-hmm. And then you talk about Adam Engel and uh, Jose Abreu and Tim Anderson and Edwin Encarnacion coming to the team from the Yankees, giving them some power at first base and the DH position. Danny Men- Mendick and and, uh, and Mancata, mm-hmm. who is one of the most underrated shortstops and really underrated all around young infielders in baseball. This team is stacked, and they're pitching. Their young pitching staff. I could go through their young pitching staff and some of the names you probably don't even know. Yes, you know Dallas Keuchel. Yes, you know uh, Gio Gonzalez. But there are guys like Aaron Bummer and Dylan Seas and Steve C- uh, Cishak and Alex Colomb. They're, they're a load of good young prospects and good young pitching in their front. And they got four of the best. I think that. I think they have four of the best young right-handed and left-handed prospect pitchers in baseball in the top 100. So this team is stacked. They are stacked. And they have, I think in the top 30, I think they have four of the top 30 players. Definitely Robert and Kopech. Yes. For sure. Four of the three of the top best young prospects in baseball in the top 30 in the league. And they're not even up yet. So this team is stacked and this team is going to be very, very good for many, many years to come. When you compare it to some of the teams like the Yankees who are still young, the Red Sox that are rebuilding, the Tampa Bay Rays that are always trying to throw away players when they get sick of them. I mean, there are not many good young teams that are rebuilding that didn't make the playoffs last year that you can talk about this year. You can talk about the Chicago White Sox. So it is the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, I think the White Sox were a great choice, and I'm really not a fan of, you know, plugging our own stuff, but I do like to do it when it provides value to the audience. It's something that will provide any viewer, or anyone listening, of understanding, you know, what team can dominate for the future. If you go to prosportsoutlook.com, we have these team outlooks that include future depth charts, and you can get a great understanding of what this team is building, the roster and depth chart, and how this team is going to unfold the expectations for each of the 30 MLB teams, each of the 30 NBA teams, 32 NFL teams. So when looking at those, I think the White Sox was a great choice, but we're, we're actually going to go with the San Diego Padres, another team that's building an absolute stats farm system. They have a great pitching staff in place for, for two, three years from now. It started with Chris Paddock's rise onto the scene, his ability to dominate as a rookie, and he could be one of the best pitchers of this decade. And then you have Mackenzie Gore, one of the top prospects in baseball, dominant lefty. He's going to come in, probably be successful right away. And you combine that with a guy named Luis Patino, who's another guy who has all-star potential. He could be in the big leagues as soon as next year and could be a um, solid starter, you know, come 2022 and be that guy for the next eight years to continue their success. But what really sticks out about the Padres is just their extreme depth. I mean, they have guys in place to start, and then they have two, three more guys that are going to be ready to do that in the next two, three years. So what that means is they have all these pieces ready to go to to make these blockbuster trades, to go acquire that Chris Bryant, to go acquire those players 
that might not get that contract extension that could come to San Diego, which is obviously not a big market. They probably can't, you know, spend big, but they show that they will go out and go get an Eric Hosmer. They will go get a Manny Machado. They will do the things that they need to do to put the right pieces in place. And Manny Machado is the perfect person to lead this team as a Hispanic player, as a player who's been through it. He knows what it takes to go to the World Series. He has that experience. And he's leading a guy who also is right next to him, one of the biggest studs in baseball, maybe sports in general, Fernando Tatis Jr., who's going to probably be a perennial all-star throughout this decade. And when you combine that and the next two, three stars that they acquire with their elite depth, you have a team that's talented and that could run away with a lot of divisions and possibly a few world championships. Yeah, the Padres have depth for days. They'll be able to go out and execute blockbuster trades. And like Rob said, last year they really came on the scene and really acquired some big free agents such as Manny Machado. And Manny Machado is a player that's been through a rebuilding process like he did in Baltimore under Buck Showalter, where he took a team that was 16 years of absolute nothing, of complete garbage, and he helped build that team up into a true playoff threat and a constant playoff contender. And just the depth of this team, the ability to make trades, the ability to make moves, the ability to just have young players that can start now and start for a long time in the future just screams the Padres could be a true powerhouse for a long time. And they're the only team in San Diego as well. The only thing I would argue that point is, is the Padres play in a division with the Cubs. I mean, I'm not, no, I'm not the Cubs, I'm sorry, the Dodgers. The Dodgers. Mm-hmm. the Dodgers, I'm sorry. They play in the division with the Dodgers and the Arizona Diamondbacks that are two very, very good teams. And they've been in San Francisco, will grow. Obviously, they got to build their farm system up, but they're always good. And Colorado is also always a good team. When you look at the Chicago White Sox, look at the division they're in. They're, one of the, they're in the easiest division in professional baseball. It's not even close. Minnesota, Cleveland. Cleveland's rebuilding now. Minnesota, as much as they, they built their pe- pitching staff in the offseason and they added Mahita and, and the players that they have, this is a team that is all power and really they don't hit for average. This is a team that they're the Yankees of really the the mid-2000 era. That's what they are. That's what the Twins are. And you can see they can't beat the Yankees in a playoff run. That's the difference. When you look at the Chicago White Sox, they're in Kansas City. Are they going to be any good for many, many years? Probably not. Detroit, are they going to be good? <laughs> Detroit's no. going to be bad for longer. <laughs> I mean, Cleveland, are they going to be good now? They're trading away uh, Trevor Bauer and all the other pitchers that they had. They're rebuilding. They'll be too. competitive, but they're not going to be a They're force. rebuilding. Yeah. And Minnesota, a team that has a lot of power. Their pitching staff is good on paper. They have to prove it in the playoffs, and I don't believe they will. I think the Chicago White Sox have a better, easier run throughout their division than the Padres and, do. And that's even if the idea. Twins are still great in certain years, there always seems to be that team that's such on, on and off team. They're great one year, and then they fall off the next. So the Twins always have seemed to be that team the last couple of years as well. Mm-hmm. All right, our next question for you guys. Who was the best player in the first round of the very loaded 2007 NFL draft that's including Calvin Tom- uh, Calvin Johnson, Joe Thomas, Adrian Peterson, Patrick Willis, Marshawn Lynch, Darrell Revis, and Joe Staley, just some of the big names there. Who do you think was the best player of that group this, and why? This is gonna be awesome. All right, so we're talking about the draft that started with the biggest bust of the 2000s in Jamarcus Russell. So probably not going to go Jamarcus Russell. Talk about Adrian Peterson. You got Joe Thomas, Marshawn Lynch. Darrell Revis, no, is that for, yeah, first round, yeah, Darrell Revis. I'm gonna take a player who didn't even play, or who is not even playing anymore. And if you're talking about the best player, not the greatest player, but the best player, the best the, player, <laughs> the best <laughs> player in your mind out of that draft, right? And I'm gonna take the best wide receiver that I've ever seen, the best wide receiver that you've ever seen, the most dominant wide receiver during his time. Not long. I saw Jerry Rice you know, play, buddy. I saw Jerry Rice right. play. <laughs> Jerry Rice has longevity. But if you have a guy on the left or on the right outside and you say, hey, go catch the ball, there's no one you'd rather take than Calvin Johnson. And that's who I'm going to go with. Megatron was a different beast. He had speed. He had size. He had power. He could go up and get it. He could make the slant. He could take screens to the house. He could do everything you want from a player. And he took a team that I believe was uh, 0-16 right after he got drafted. And then alongside an actual somewhat decent quarterback in Matthew Stafford because he had a trash quarterback before that. They actually had some some solid runs together. Obviously, the rest of the team didn't allow them to compete in the playoffs or do much damage. But this pure, one player's pure being able to dominate, it's hard to say anyone 
was at the level that Calvin Johnson was during his prime. I mean, just looking at some of the big names in this draft, you see some really massive game-changing type of players, such as Calvin Johnson, Adrian Peterson, and Marshawn Lynch. All three of those players truly define what it was like to be a power player at their position. But when it comes to true dominance, I'm going to have to go with Adrian Peterson. I've watched Adrian Peterson go year in, year out, just dominate, one through people's chest, and just carry a Minnesota team to success that really did not have business having success. Adrian Peterson is one of the best running backs of all time. In my opinion, he's the favorite running back I've ever seen play the game. He just puts pure dominance in it year in and year out. And he's still playing the game as of today. Um, he's played for multiple franchises. He's AP. He's all day. They feed him. He's led the league in rushing three times. He had 18 touchdowns back in 2009. I think Adrian Peterson is just a force. Nobody wanted to tackle him for about 15 years. Nobody wanted to get Adrian Peterson's way. And I just think he's just the most dominant force ever to play the running back position from a training standpoint. Alrighty, so d- two different answers there, and I think Errol and I have two different answers too. I'm actually going to take this argument a little differently. I'm going to take Joe Thomas. A lot of the guys that, again, offensive linemen, they don't have the numbers to really show that. They You could look at pancake blocks and stuff like that, but again, Joe Thomas was the best left tackle in the league for basically his entire career on a team that was never good. Just think about that. The Browns have been so dysfunctional. I think they're the worst run organization in any sport. When you look at it, how many bad quarterbacks did they go through? They had some years of decent running backs with a year of Jamal Lewis, the one year of Peyton Hillis. You have some decent years. Isaiah Crowell had one, but again, they really were just so inconsistent, just down, just developing players in general. Then Joe Thomas was a force for a long time. He was the steady, durable player. The first, the first year he missed a game was his last year in the league. He played seven games. He had a bad injury and he ultimately retired. He played 16 games every year. And again, when you look at the circumstances, just that cannot be stated enough how bad the Browns were, how many coaches, how many bad quarterbacks. And he was the driving force of that offense really the whole time played well amidst all those circumstances. And again, is one of the best tackles you'll ever see. Ten-time Pro Bowler, six-time All-Pro left tackle for a team that was terrible. So I think that's something that ends up getting lost just because the offensive line is not really a a statistically dominant position because they don't have the stats to look at outside of pancake blocking. I'm going to go with Darrell Revis, and, and I, I, I follow Darrell Revis. I'm a Jet fan growing up, so I, I had an opportunity to actually meet him and interview him over a couple of times. His dominance at, at the position. Now, you talk about wide receivers. Jerry Rice is the greatest wide receiver I've seen in my, in my eyes. Now, Calvin Johnson was great. He dominated for eight years in the league, but he wasn't even a, the best all-around wide receiver if you compare that. There were a lot of good wide receivers when Calvin Johnson played. Brandon Marshall, if you, if you compare, and I'm not saying he's as good as Calvin Johnson, but if you compare their numbers for five or six years they're very identical so I, I'm, I'm not saying Calvin Johnson and Brent, both of them are Hall, Hall of Famers but Darrell Rivas go look at what he did at the corner position when you could try to compare who could you compare to Darrell Rivas of our time Charles Woodson uh Deion Sanders I mean there are not many guys that play the position and he transitioned the defensive position at the corner position you can say whatever you want Richard Sherman you could say whatever you want this guy was the best shut down corner in the league for almost five years when you ask Calvin Johnson you ask Andre um, Andre, Johnson. Andre Johnson you ask anybody that played wide receiver against him one on one nobody would throw to that side of the uh, side of the field because of Darrell Rivas Darrell Rivas was with the Patriots so. could I speak for a second you spoke enough Darrell Revis was the most dominant player at a position for almost five years. There was nobody even close to him. Now you talk about Richard Sherman, and Richard Sherman talks up, and, and Peterson. Peterson came out, and Peterson has been the best corner for almost five, five, six years before they transitioned the game. And and Peterson said Darrell Revis is the best corner he has ever played against, and he's the best corner that he thinks of all time, even before Deion Sanders. So again, when you when you look at dominance, complete dominance, just like when you look at the running back position and Adrian Peterson and what he did at the running back position. Yes, Adrian Peterson of our time has been the most dominant running back. And Calvin Johnson is probably all around, besides Julio Jones, the best wide receiver of our era. Absolutely is. 
But Darrell Rivas, and you can say whatever you want to Richard Sherman Peterson or any corner that's been in the league for the last 10 years, and you try to compare him to this guy at the top of his game, there is no comparison. And Joe Thomas was a great a great uh, offensive lineman, but there were a lot of good offensive linemen playing in the league just like Joe Thomas. So uh, I'm, I'm going to say Darrell Rivas because he dominated a position that really he was the first – corner that get that big huge contract at that position so it is Darrell Rivas